Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. I worked pizza delivery a few years ago. Now that I don't there anymore, I figured I'd share this gem. Me. Me. Do. Lead. My shift lead PG phone girl. For a little while, some of the phone girls were jealous of how much money the drivers made in tips every night. We averaged about 90 to 150s on a good night, but their own tips usually ran about 20 to 30. One girl, PG, wanted drivers to share tips with the phone girls, even though they had their own tip pool that was split with the cooks. TG even tried to get the store manager to sign off on it. He wasn't having any of it, and ignored all the drivers when we told her just how much of our tips went to fuel and maintenance. TG wanted half of all driver tips to be split with the phone girls and cooks, despite having their own tip pool. Heck, the cooks were paid more than the rest of us since they had the hardest job in the store. Seriously, they sometimes had to crank out up to 50 pizzas in 20 minutes on busier days. TG was a girl whose job was to answer a phone and take an order down on a computer that did half the work for her. While they were also supposed to make salads, that wasn't nearly as much as the cooks or drivers did. Hell, most of the time a driver ended up cleaning up the front end when the phone girls decided they weren't up to it. Finally had enough of it one day. So I told PG, too, her face that what she wanted to do violated state law. She still argued against it, so I decided to bide my time and wait. Here's the thing. I was well known for splitting any tips that I got that were over 20 with backup houses. So I decided to wait until I got the local rich guy delivery. For the record, rich guy was well known for giving extravagant tips. I'm talking like $150 for a pair of 14-inch pizzas and some breadsticks which ran about $50. The management hated it because they had to call him the next day each time and verify that, yes, he meant to tip that much. And the kicker, Super Bowl Sunday was coming up, and I knew that big tips were coming. The best part was that he liked to ask for certain drivers, and I was one of the ones scheduled that he normally asked for. I talked with some of the other drivers who were scheduled that day to make sure that they were on board, and we set the plan in motion. We even had our shift lead in on it which played into things later. Super Bowl was about a week after the discussion between me and PG. Rit Guy ordered, and I got the order. And boy, did he pay out that debt. He'd been having a party, and he ordered almost 300 worth of 18-inch pizzas, breadsticks, chicken bites, and wings. When I got there, he gave me 200s in a single tip, which doubled my tips for the night. At the end of the night, I counted up my tips and started to do my usual. But I stopped at the end when I was reporting tips on my end of night. Most of the staff were waiting for me to finish, since I was known for sharing large tips, even the other drivers who knew what was coming. Calling my lead over to the register that I was reporting my final counts on, we had a discussion that we knew PG was listening in on. Me. Rich guy gave me 200 for a tip. We going through the usual routine? Lead. Yeah, I'll leave a note to call him in the morning to verify again. Me. Great, thanks. Led, you doing the usual thing? Referring to my habit of sharing tips over 20? Me. Nah, I'm kind of done with it. Led, hmm? I thought you always shared tips over 20? Me. Yeah, but I got sick of certain people who keep talking about forcing us drivers to share our tips. Led, oh, I see. Yeah, that would get me irritated as well. But you are aware that they can't do that, right? Me. They seem determined to try. So I'm going to start keeping all my tips to prove a point. Lead. Fair enough. It's your money. Even I can't force you to share it. And that's law. Tube G had been waiting in the corner of the store for me to finish my count and share my tips the whole time. From what one of the others told me afterwards, her face turned about the color of a tomato during this whole exchange. Finishing up my count and dropping my money, I got ready to leave. Some of the cooks were waiting by the back door, expecting me to share as usual when I just walked by them. Thinking I'd forgot about them? One of them asked, in a not-so-subtle manner. Dang, that was busy? Did you make good tips tonight? Yup, I reply. Not doing your usual? One asked. He knew he wasn't allowed to ask me directly to share tips, but he'd been one of the ones I usually split tips with. No? You can ask Lead about it if you want to. But I've stopped doing that for now. 
I had the next couple of days off, so I wasn't there for most of the storm that followed. The cooks that I usually split with got curious and asked Led about what had happened. And since I told him I didn't mind him telling, he told them the truth, that one of the phone girls had been getting under my nerves about sharing tips, which wasn't legal. He then pointed asked why they thought it was strange that I wasn't sharing tips. When he was told that was my usual thing, he commented in a not-so-subtle way that it was very generous of him. Needless to say, the cooks, who'd been the beneficiaries of my generosity, weren't that amused that I stopped being so generous and wanted to know why. PG soon started getting the cold shoulder from most of the other back-of-house staff, and she soon complained to the owner, who'd been unaware of my normal generosity, that she was getting bullied. After a call to come in to work on my day off, I was asked what was going on by the owner. So I told him everything. The next Friday, everyone was scheduled for a mandatory meeting. Owner came in and explained that forcing an employee to share tips was a violation of state and federal law, and that if he ever heard of someone being pressured to split their tips again, he would be reporting it to the labor board and firing the person responsible. TG was ordered to apologize to the driver she'd been bugging about splitting tips, and I worked my next few shifts as usual. TG never gave me trouble after that, and eventually I started sharing larger than normal tips again into the general tip pool. I ended up changing jobs about a year later, but I still look back at that job fondly. I loved working there and would gladly go back if they ever asked me to work part-time again. On a more positive note, PG has really turned herself around and is even going to be a store manager at a different location soon. We ended up burying the hatchet a few months after the whole thing. Back in 2010, I found myself living in Winter Garden, Florida, with my husband and his terminally ill uncle. The circumstances leading us there were unfortunate as we had experienced significant losses during the 2008 housing market crash, just like many of my husband's lawn maintenance customers. In the midst of our financial struggles, we made the decision to move in with his uncle, who was suffering from stage 4 cirrhosis of the liver. Surprisingly, his self-entitled sister and her family refused to lend a helping hand in taking care of him. My husband, a retired Seminole County Sheriff's officer, which became important later in the story, and I settled into the two bedrooms of the condo while his uncle occupied the living room where he had set up his bed. However, we soon discovered a series of problems in the condo. On the first day, we came across dangerous black mold caused by a leaky dishwasher. The following day, we noticed loose tiles and a leaky shower head in the master shower. To our horror, on the third day, we stumbled upon a nest of brown recluse spiders in the living room. We promptly discussed these issues with his uncle only to find out that the landlord, whom we referred to as the slumlord, was refusing to address these problems as required by law. Although we were inclined to take legal action at the time, my husband's uncle managed to dissuade us on multiple occasions. Interestingly, the slumlord remained cordial, as long as my husband's uncle was alive. However, everything changed the day after his uncle's passing. The slumlord's behavior became hostile, aggressive, and he began exerting pressure on us to vacate the premises, treating us as nothing more than drug-addicted squatters. In fact, when we dropped off our next rent check, he even tried to physically confront my husband. Despite his threats and demands, the slumlord refused to follow the proper eviction procedures outlined in Florida laws. Adding to our troubles, the slumlord's corrupt associate, his wife, who happened to be a Winter Garden PD code enforcement officer, recruited my husband's self-idled aunt and uncle to harass us, suggesting we should just move even if it meant living in a tent. Self-entitled aunt, why don't you and my nephew, the retired SCSD officer, just leave so they can rent the condo to another senior? Husband, we currently have nowhere else to go, and he must abide by the eviction laws. Otherwise, he'll face serious consequences. Self-entitled aunt, you're nothing but trouble. Retired SCSD officer, You've been causing problems since the day you were born. Get out of their condo and stop being a nuisance for everyone. Who cares if you have to live in a tent? All these events arouse suspicion in my husband, who, having specialized in uncovering corrupt law enforcement during his tenure, became especially wary. We discussed the situation and decided to launch our own investigation into the slumlord and the corrupt code enforcement wife. Firstly, we started placing all rent payments into an escrow account, meticulously documenting the neglected repairs. Secondly, we sent a cease and desist notice to the slumlord and the self-entitled aunt, putting an end to their harassment. 
Simultaneously, I delved into researching public property tax records, and to my delight, I struck gold. It turned out that the slumlord's condo wasn't registered as a rental property with the state of Florida, allowing him to pay significantly less in property taxes than he should have been. Furthermore, the property tax records revealed that the condo was not even owned by the slumlord. It was still deeded to his mother, who, as I discovered, had been residing in a retirement home for the past five years, long before my husband's uncle moved in. As our investigation deepened, my husband uncovered the alarming fact that the corrupt code enforcement wife had been inspecting and approving her own properties, including the condo, which clearly violated the conduct laws of Florida's code enforcement. Additionally, I learned from neighbors in the condo complex that the slumlord had exclusively rented to seniors with severe health issues. However, the most significant discovery we made, second only to the tax evasion, was the existence of a strict policy within the Condo Owners Association, which prohibited renting or leasing of units. This meant that the condo could only be occupied by the owner or their family. Renting it out was strictly prohibited. Armed with all the evidence we had collected, my husband and I began to dismantle the slumlord's carefully constructed empire. My husband wasted no time and filed a formal complaint against the corrupt code enforcement wife with the Winter Garden Police Department. Given his outstanding record in Seminole County and his previous accomplishments in exposing corruption, including uncovering misconduct within Child Protective Services in the early 2000s, his complaint carried significant weight. This background played a crucial role in prompting the Winter Garden Police Department to launch an investigation into the corrupt code enforcement wife. The investigation revealed not only her perjury during inspections on her family's properties, but also on the property owned by my husband's self-entitled aunt and uncle. As a result, the corrupt code enforcement wife was terminated from her position, had her state enforcement officer's license revoked, and faced multiple criminal charges. Meanwhile, I submitted all the evidence of property tax fraud to Florida's property tax division, which led to a state investigation into the slumlord. The investigation uncovered not only his property tax fraud related to the condo, but also fraudulent activities regarding a property he had been renting to his son and my husband's self, entitled Aunt's Son. Additionally, it was discovered that he had committed business tax fraud and income tax fraud. In a surprising turn of events, both Slumlord's son and my husband's self-entitled aunt's son were arrested for possessing illegal narcotics with intent to sell when investigators arrived at the rental house where they resided. The extent of the fraud discovered during this process exceeded our expectations, but we were relieved that justice was being served. The business tax fraud perpetrated by the Slumlord also implicated my husband's self-entitled aunt and uncle since they were his business partners. The self-entitled uncle, who held the position of postmaster in Winter Garden, came under investigation by the United States Postal Service, USPS, due to his involvement in the tax fraud scheme and the embezzlement of money orders. As a result, he lost his job and pension. All four individuals, the slumlord, his wife, my husband's self-entitled aunt, and my husband's self-entitled uncle, were convicted of multiple white-collar crimes. They were forced to sell their properties and most of their belongings, serve various forms of jail time, and face substantial fines and restitution orders. In the end, the slumlord, his wife, my husband's self-entitled aunt, and my husband's self-entitled uncle, along with their sons, were brought down by a multitude of felony and misdemeanor charges, all because they attempted to strong arm us into eviction. This whole experience serves as a testament to the intelligence and resourcefulness of tenants when pushed to their limits. It also highlights the importance of being knowledgeable about rental laws and proficient in researching public records, as such knowledge can ultimately save you from undesirable situations. So, picture this. I'm cruising down the road on my way to work just minding my own business, when out of nowhere, this lady who's the epitome of what they call a Karen decides to make a wrong turn right into the side of my pickup truck. Like, um... I can't even react before she jumps out of her car like she's auditioning for a role in a drama queen contest. She steps out of her car, and this is what happened. Karen, shouting, You just hit my car, you idiot! Me. Oh, lady, calm down. You made the wrong turn, not me. Let's exchange insurance info and we can sort this out. But oh boy, this Karen wasn't having any of that. She starts screaming at me like I've just insulted her cat or something. Karen, still shouting, I'm not exchanging anything with you. You're paying for this. 
I want cash right now. Now, I'm no insurance expert, but I know you're supposed to call the cops when things go south like this. So I tell her I'm going to do just that. Me, getting out my phone. Fine, we'll let the cops figure this out. And that, my friends, is when Karen's fuse got shorter than a stubby pencil. Karen, you're calling the cops on me. You little... But before she could finish that sentence, she dashes to her car trunk and pulls out a baseball bat. Yes, a real-life wooden baseball bat. I'm thinking, is she going to play a game of baseball or what? Karen, I'll give you a reason to call the cops. And she starts going to town on my poor pickup truck like it's a pinata at a kid's birthday party. I couldn't believe my eyes. The sound of that bat hitting my truck made me cringe like I was watching a horror movie. Me, shouting, Hey, what the heck are you doing? Karen, still swinging the bat. You want the cops? I'll give you the cops. Now imagine the scene. Karen's bashing my truck. I'm standing there with my phone recording this insanity for evidence and praying that the cops arrive ASAP. Well, guess what? Lady Luck finally decided to show up in the form of two police officers. They pull up, lights flashing, and I swear they must have thought they stumbled into a crazy circus act. Cop one, with a raised eyebrow, what's going on here? Before I could utter a word, Karen jumps in like she's been rehearsing this performance her whole life. Karen, pointing at me, officer, this man assaulted me and tried to steal my car. Me, are you kidding me? Cop two, looking at me and Karen, all right? Let's calm down. Sir, ma'am, we need to hear both sides of the story. So, there we are, in the middle of the road, Karen with a bat in hand and me with my phone, trying to explain what happened. I show the officers the video I took, which pretty much seals the deal in my favor. Cop 1. Ma'am, you're under arrest for assault and destruction of property. Karen. What? You're arresting me? Cop 2. Handcuffing Karen. That's right. You have the right to remain silent. I couldn't help but grin as they read her the Miranda rights. Justice, my friends, was being served on a platter today. Long story short, they took Karen away in the squad car, and I was left with my battered but still standing pickup truck. The officers told me that she'd be facing some hefty fines for the damages she'd done. Karma, as they say, is a real, you know, what? As for me, I finally made it to work, albeit a bit late. But hey, the story I had to tell my co-workers about my wild morning made up for it. And I learned a valuable lesson that day. Never underestimate the power of a Karen armed with a baseball bat. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. So this happened over 30 years ago, when I was 16 in the 1980s. In those days, there were adverts in the press for a record club. This is actual physical albums where you could get some albums free by signing up and then get sent three a month after that, which you had to pay for by a money order within 30 days or get charged interest. So I used it for a few months and it was okay, but then there was less and less good choices and I wanted to cancel the subscription. Each month I got the albums, I could return them in prepaid plastic envelopes. But for the first few months, I kept the album so I had a load of spare prepaid envelopes, important for later. When the quality of albums went down, I just sent them back but this was becoming a nuisance since it was getting close to when I was due to go to college and move away from home. I contacted the company to cancel the subscription, but that's when they nuked me by saying that I'd agreed a 36-month rolling contract from each agreed purchase. Waiting three years to get rid of this was not an option, because I'd need to return every month to my parents to return the album. I told them I was moving away. They were not interested thinking they had me, and they did. They told me to send anything back I did not need each month and pay for what I kept, and they would start the ending of my contract from when I stopped buying albums. I made it clear I had stopped Q the malicious compliance. I thought about all the things I did not need that I could send them apart from the garbage albums I was being sent each month. My dad did building work on the side of his main job, so we hard hardcore and cement in abundance at the back of the house. So I got one of the first plastic prepaid envelopes and filled it with hardcore and wet cement waiting for it to set. It was almost too heavy for me to carry to the post office, but I got it there. The company had to pay by weight for whatever was in the envelope, so it would have cost a lot. I phoned them two weeks after that. I mentioned I had quite a few envelopes, and they wisely decided to cancel my account immediately. 
If it looks too good to be true, then it is. I learned that it's 17. This story takes place during the early days of my marriage. Shortly after my wife and I tied the knot, my beloved grandfather passed away, leaving me a substantial inheritance. Along with the inheritance came a heartfelt note, advising me to use the funds wisely to establish a good life for my wife and me. Meanwhile, my father-in-law, who happens to own a real estate company specializing in purchasing and renovating foreclosed houses, informed us about an ideal starter home. He generously offered to cover the cost of rehabilitating the house, with the expectation that we would repay him once we were more financially stable, or within two years if we decided to sell the house. Excited about this opportunity, we purchased the house and patiently waited for the renovations to be completed before moving in, a process that took approximately 90 days. After settling into our new home for about two weeks, an unexpected visitor arrived at our doorstep claiming to be the president of the Homeowners Association, HOA. They inquired about my landlord's contact information, assuming we were mere renters. Politely, I clarified that we were the proud homeowners, only to be further questioned about my parents. Reiterating that I was the legitimate owner, I asked them the purpose of their visit. The individual explained that there was an HO governing our neighborhood and that I needed to sign the HOA rule. They also informed me that I owed $90 in prorated dues, but generously offered a 30-day grace period for payment. However, they insisted that I sign the rules immediately. Cautiously, I requested to review the regulations first, before committing to anything. Strangely, they became quite insistent about immediate signing. Sensing their pushiness, I firmly declined, emphasizing my intention to read and understand the rules thoroughly before making any agreements. They reluctantly granted me a seven-day window to sign the documents, reminding me that failing to comply would result in legal fines. Feeling unsure about how to navigate this new experience with HOAs, I reached out to my in-laws for guidance. I explained the situation and asked for their advice. My father-in-law expressed his frustration, stating that the existence of an HOA should have been disclosed prior to the house sale. He mentioned that sometimes such details are overlooked, particularly with HUD houses. Nevertheless, we acknowledged that the $30 monthly fee wasn't exorbitant, considering the amenities provided, such as a delightful neighborhood playground. With their reassurance, I eventually agreed to sign the rules, despite finding a few of them rather excessive. At the time, I felt compelled to comply, believing I had no other viable choice. For a while, things seemed relatively uneventful. Around a month later, my wife and I decided to host a small housewarming party for a few close friends. As the evening progressed, our intimate gathering, comprising only eight people, including us, took place on our cozy deck. We had set up a modest fire pit, a thoughtful gift from one of our friends, and were enjoying the evening when an abrupt pounding knock startled me. It sounded like a police officer demanding entry. Intrigued and slightly concerned, I hurriedly went to investigate, only to find the HOA president parked in front of our house, their car equipped with a yellow police light on top. To my astonishment, the HOA president, with an air of sternness, informed me that I had violated the HOA rules by hosting a party beyond the approved hours of 10 p.m. It was now 10, 5 p.m. according to my watch. I found this enforcement incredibly strict, but decided to comply nonetheless. Reluctantly, we moved the gathering inside. The very next day, I received an official warning from the HOA, accusing me of throwing a wild bonfire that posed a safety hazard due to drinking, which was entirely false as I hadn't consumed any alcohol. Brushing it off, I dismissed the incident as insignificant. Fast forward six to nine months later, we organized a teen group devotional one afternoon and decided to play a friendly game of football on our rarely trafficked connecting street. Only two houses, ours and family across from us, existed on this road. The children from both households joined in the game. Suddenly, a police siren blared, accompanied by flashing yellow lights. It was the HOA president, insisting that we immediately discontinue our activities due to safety concerns, claiming that a child could be run over. Frustrated with his constant interference, I retorted that we had been vigilant, watching for cars, and he was the first vehicle we had seen during the hour-long game. Despite my objections, he persisted, raising the issue of emergency vehicles potentially needing access to our street. This argument seemed baseless, since both of our connecting streets had entrances from the main road. Reluctantly, 
I yielded to his demands, and we retreated indoors. The following day, I received a letter stating that I was being fined the maximum amount of $60 for the first offense, with an option to protest the fine at the next HOA meeting. However, I noticed that the fine was due in 30 days, while the next meeting was scheduled for 35 days later. Determined to contest the fine, I chose not to pay until after the hearing. I promptly replied to the HOA president, notifying him of my decision. When the meeting arrived, I found myself facing an assembly consisting of the HOA president, his wife who served as the HOA secretary, the vice president, who happened to be the president's neighbor and the treasurer, the vice president's wife. My protest was swiftly dismissed, and to add insult to injury, I was charged an additional $30 late fee for not paying on time, despite having informed the HOA president beforehand. Fed up with the relentless enforcement, I realized I had reached my breaking point but felt powerless to take any significant action. About four to five months later, my wife and I joyously welcomed our first child into the world. One night, upon returning home from my second job in retail, my military buddy called to congratulate me. Not wanting to disturb my peacefully sleeping newborn daughter, I opted to remain in my car with the engine running, as the night air was slightly chilly. I sat in my car for around half an hour, enjoying a moment of peace, when suddenly I heard a blaring police siren and saw the flashing yellow light. It was right in front of my house, and the noise was anything but subtle. The intrusive light even managed to seep into my daughter's bedroom. Irritated, I stepped out of the car and rather brusquely requested the officer to turn off the light to avoid waking my daughter. His response was perplexing. He claimed I appeared suspicious sitting in my car with the engine running outside my own home. I proceeded to explain the situation, but he remained dismissive, stating that my troublemaker history wouldn't grant me any leniency. At that point, frustration got the better of me, and I expressed my dissatisfaction with his attitude. I even told him exactly what I thought of his behavior. Refusing to back down, I sat on the hood of my car. He lingered for another 15 minutes, persistently urging me to go inside. At one point, he even touched my shoulder, which prompted me to warn him that any further physical contact would be seen as aggression, and I would defend myself. In response, he eventually retreated, got into his car, and left. He circled the block about four times in the next 30 minutes, but the cold weather finally forced me to seek refuge inside my home. The following day, I received a hand-delivered letter from the HOA president and the vice president. The HOA president requested that I step outside to discuss last night's incident. He claimed he had shown me leniency by refraining from involving the police after I'd supposedly threatened him. Cutting him off, I firmly demanded that he leave my property face potential trespassing charges. Reading the letter, I discovered that he was imposing two separate fines, each amounting to $180, the maximum allowable penalty. One fine was for violating the curfew, and the other was for disobeying the night watchman. I had simply had enough. I had reached my breaking point. This is where my quest for justice began. Motivated by a sense of injustice and abuse, I delved into the laws and regulations governing HOAs and their fine. I soon unearthed a crucial detail. According to the law, homeowners must be notified of an HOA 10 days prior to closing on a house, and they must receive the HOA rules within 45 days of the purchase. Failure to comply with these requirements means homeowners cannot be compelled to participate in the HOA. Recalling our experience, I realized we were not served with the rules until after we had already moved in, which was close to 90 days after our closing. Taking action, I contacted my real estate agent who happens to be a trusted family friend. She had facilitated countless home purchases for my in-laws over the past 35 years and was well-versed in the intricacies of the process. I asked her if she still had the necessary paperwork, and she assured me that she could provide a copy. Upon examination, we discovered that we had been notified over 90 days after the purchase, with no disclosure statement provided at the closing. My realtor expressed her surprise, acknowledging that it was legally required to provide the disclosure statement before the sale. Such documentation is typically received during a title inspection to determine whether or not there is a registered HOA. After conducting further research, she called me back two days later with astonishing news. Our neighborhood was not registered with the city or county as an HOA, a requirement by law. I decided to take action and called the county office responsible for HOA registrations. Upon providing them with the name of our neighborhood, 
they informed me that our neighborhood was actually registered in a different city, not our own. They explained that if we wished to establish an HOA, we would need to follow specific procedures, without which the HOA would lack the authority to collect any fees or exert control. It turned out that our neighborhood had initially been within one city's jurisdiction, but when the city lines changed, our neighborhood became divided. The other portion of the neighborhood retained the registered HOA, while our HOA president was supposed to register with the state, but chose not to comply with the required steps. Initially, my impulse was to storm over to the president's house and confront him directly. However, I decided to approach the situation more tactfully. I spoke with my neighbor across the street, who also harbored disdain for the HOA, and shared the information I had discovered. He, too, was incensed by the revelation. Together, we engaged with a few more neighbors, forming a group of around 10 individuals who were united in their conviction to attend the upcoming HOA meeting. Word quickly spread, resulting in an unexpectedly large turnout that exceeded the capacity of the library meeting room where the meeting was held. I specifically requested to speak on behalf of the group, and they graciously granted me the opportunity. However, the president attempted to silence me, citing my outstanding fines. By that point, I was approximately three weeks behind on my payments, with a $30 weekly penalty per fine. Consequently, my current bill amounted to roughly $540. Despite his objections, I proceeded with my address. I explained to them that I had sought legal advice from my in-law's attorney, also a trusted family friend, who had prepared a lawsuit asserting that they were masquerading as a registered HOA in order to collect money from us, constituting fraud. The president dismissed my claims, suggesting that I had no understanding of the situation and that he had grown wary of my antics. The staff members promptly left while the rest of us remained to discuss the matter further. A month later, myself and 20 other homeowners formally served them with a lawsuit. We sought reimbursement for all fines and HOAE dues we had paid, totaling approximately $50,000. Some families had been residents for over a decade, accumulating significant amounts. The president and vice president enlisted their own attorney, who attempted to legitimize the HOA. However, in order to achieve legitimacy, they needed the signatures of approximately 90 of the homeowners. Regrettably for them, they managed to secure only three signatures, including their own and that of another individual. This failed attempt prompted them to propose a settlement, the abolition of the HOA. They claimed that the funds collected had been utilized for park maintenance, snow removal, and other neighborhood events without any personal financial gain. We took a vote, and this was turned down in overwhelming fashion. I was surprised I actually voted to accept this. Then about a week later, one of the other families called and mentioned something about the park maintenance and snow removal. Apparently, he had given a quote to do the landscaping for the park, cutting the grass, mulching, etc., and his quote had been a couple hundred bucks cheaper than what they were paying and that it had always bothered him because the person that did those jobs was the vice president's son, and that what they were paying him was pretty outrageous in terms of what's standard. Eventually, it went to court, where the judge looked at everything and mandated that they pay $20, $1,000, $1,000 per each homeowner, plus attorney and court fees, which were like another $2,000 for a total of $23,000 in damages. Additionally, they were fined by the city's governing body after it was reported. I don't know how much that fine was, though. We ended up selling the house that following summer, but I talked to a couple friends that still live there about a year after it, and they said that the president and vice president both sold their houses and moved away because they were pretty much hated by everyone in the neighborhood and that. They had an informal HOA that people donated to for upkeep of the park. Trigger warning, I guess. Surprisingly, it's unrelated to trigger discipline. It was the late 2000s in Iraq, and I found myself serving as a squad leader, navigating the tense and dangerous environment while trying to keep my team safe. With two team leaders and six soldiers under my command, our mission on that particular day was to search for potential threats, things that could go boom. Little did we know that danger would find us instead. In a cruel twist of fate, we were caught off guard by one of the most devastating threats we could encounter, an explosively formed projectile, EFP. These deadly projectiles, once they penetrate their target, turn the armored vehicle into a confined space filled with searing heat and lethal shrapnel. Our vehicle was struck by not just one, but three EFPs simultaneously. 
The first EFP went beneath my seat, tearing through the other side while the second one hit the engine. The third EFP found its mark on the tail of the RG-33. I lost consciousness in the chaos, but after what felt like an eternity, I regained my senses. The deafening sounds of gunfire and the rattling of the EI-50 caliber machine gun filled the air, courtesy of my gunner who was determined to turn the attacker into nothing more than a mist of red. Assessing the situation, I realized that no one under my command has sustained serious injuries, despite the terrifying ordeal. With my radios rendered useless, I attempted to communicate with my superiors for a situation report, only to discover that they had prematurely assumed we were lost in action, relying on drone footage to draw their conclusion. It took me some time to repair the backup radio, as it too had taken a beating. Through the thick, acrid smoke, my vision impaired, and amidst the ongoing engagement, I prioritized the well-being and morale of my team over fixing the communication equipment. Eventually, I deployed smoke grenades to signal that we were still operational, and shortly after, I managed to re-establish communication. Sadly, a communication blackout had already been triggered, leaving us without contact with the U.S. for a grueling three days. During this blackout, word reached a certain individual within the Family Readiness Group, a gathering of curious and gossipy individuals determined to create unnecessary drama. This particular person considered herself the self-proclaimed Queen Dependa, asserting authority over others. She had caused numerous stressful situations before, but my focus remained on staying alive and avoiding unnecessary conflicts. Unbeknownst to me, the Queen Dependa took it upon herself to inform his wife that her husband had been killed, a serious breach of protocol, especially since it was based solely on hearsay. Even three of her friends advised her to allow the military to handle such delicate matters properly, considering the unreliable nature of hearsay. For an agonizing three days, his wife believed her beloved husband to be dead, only to discover later that he was alive and well. Needless to say, we were furious when we finally learned this cruel miscommunication. His wife experienced a whirlwind of emotions ranging from relief to confusion and anger. The emotional roller coaster she endured must have been unimaginable perhaps even requiring professional therapy, but I refrained from prying into her personal struggles. After the distressing incident with his wife being wrongly informed about her husband's death, I decided to reach out to a few of the understanding and supportive wives, including my friend Winky, who had lost an eye in a previous deployment. This brave group of women agreed to participate in what we dubbed Operation Hot Pocket, aimed at addressing the issue with the Queen dependent. However, I needed a solid plan to execute our strategy as the hot pockets would only serve as a distraction. After conducting some discreet inquiries, I discovered that this particular dependa had a penchant for various illicit substances and an insatiable appetite for food. While I generally didn't concern myself with her personal choices, this time we were determined to take action. My trusted insiders visited the dependa's house, armed with hot pockets and engaging in friendly conversation. They skillfully played into the queen dependa's ego, gathering information about the location of her stash. With cunning precision, they discreetly relocated some of the substances to strategic and obvious spots. The following day, as wife bravely confronted the Queen Dependa as planned, intentionally provoking her in front of unsuspecting witnesses. The plan worked flawlessly, escalating the situation to the point where the police became involved. To no one's surprise, a significant quantity of illicit substances was discovered during the investigation. Consequently, the dependa was charged with multiple felonies. It turned out that her collection of illicit substances was extensive, leading to her incarceration upon our return six months later. Unfortunately, we were unable to definitively identify the instigator who had set this entire chain of events in motion, preventing us from taking appropriate action. As for A and his wife, they eventually divorced but later rekindled their relationship and remarried once he was discharged from the military a few years later. It is highly likely that the traumatic events surrounding the false report of A's death played a significant role in their journey and decision to reconcile. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.